got a good group tonight. We're going to pick up where we left off last evening, and um, I want to start by opening God's Word before we pray. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are both very familiar texts that, that describe what happened to Satan before and during his fall. But we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and four, or 12 through 14. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan declared in his heart, I will be like the Most High. I'm going to sit upon his throne. There's no way in a million years that he really thought he was going to sit up there. I mean, he, was, he was defeated. Christ defeated him and threw him down. So what was the throne that he was saying that he was going to take? It's what we spoke about the other night. It was the throne of men's hearts. It actually says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. We know that in Scripture, Jerusalem here on the earth was a physical shadow of the heavenly Jerusalem. And the scripture tells us that New Jerusalem is the mother of us all. It's God's people. Yes, it is a literal city. I'm not denying that. But just like Fresno, if you say, well, Fresno was destroyed, well, you can be talking about the buildings or you can be talking about the people. The people are what make the city a city. Without the people, it's meaningless. Just like a church. A church is a building, but it's more importantly, it's the people that make up that church. Does that make sense? So Satan said, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. And when you look in Revelation, it actually describes New Jerusalem and it gives the dimensions. It says it lies four square and its height is equal to to each of its sides. So either you have a cube or you have a pyramid. My personal opinion is I could see it very well being a pyramid because the Bible all through the Old Testament talks about the mountain of the Lord and it equates that with his people. And if you ask any child over three years old to draw a mountain, they're going to draw a pyramid. Very simple. Um, anyway, that, that is where Lucifer said he would take possession. He would sit upon that throne. So I want us to keep that in mind as we, as we go through tonight's messages. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Father, that word Lord means the sovereign king. Father, we claim and we thank you for your promise that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, both in heaven and on earth. We ask that you send holy angels that excel in strength tonight. Fill this house with thy presence. Bind and cast out all the powers of darkness 
that would seek to interfere with your work and ministry in our lives. And Father, most of all, cause us to see your glory and to hear thy voice alone. In Jesus' name we ask, in him we believe, and thank you. Amen. I'm going to open and reread something we looked at last night. This comes uh, from one of the testimonies that Sister White gave to us. She said, as we near the close of time, there will be greater and still greater external, external, outward parade of heathen power. What's the difference between a group of people that are just walking silently down the road and a parade? A parade seeks to draw attention to itself. This statement tells us that demonic entities are going to be seeking recognition by mankind. And heathen deities will manifest their signal power and exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. And this delineation has already begun to be fulfilled. And we spoke about that last night. When I first read this, I thought, this is talking about fallen angels that we will see with our eyes. I thought, I mean, is this taking place? Because Ellen White said this has already begun to be fulfilled. And then I kept reading. All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. And I started seeing something that is so important for us to know. Two mysteries, the mystery of godliness, which 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us that is God manifest in the flesh. And then the second mystery is the mystery of iniquity. If you want to know what the mystery of iniquity is, all you have to do is know what the mystery of godliness is. God manifests in the flesh. The mystery of iniquity is Satan and his fallen angels manifest in the flesh. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day of Christ's return shall not come except there come an apostasy first and that man of sin be unveiled as the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God." Christ said something in the Gospels. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but yet don't do the things that I say? And and he actually said something very similar through the Apostle Paul. He said, don't you realize that to whom you yield yourself as a servant to obey, that's whose servants you are? I want you to remember that. Because if Christ reigns within a man or a woman's heart, do you know that scientists now have seen what Darwin never even thought was possible? They have looked inside of the human cell and they have seen it is more complex and more active than an entire city. One cell. One human cell. There are these tiny little microbes and all these little things that are obeying the instructions that are given to them by the DNA. That DNA is actually the instructions or the book of life according to what scientists are saying. So that means that every organ of our body, every cell of our body is supposed to be under the authority and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Jesus healed the sick. When men surrendered their heart to him, he took the driver's seat 
and he commanded every organ of their body, every gland, every nerve, and every cell, obey, bring yourself into submission. And he, he causes that to happen today, just as he did 2,000 years ago. But when sin is introduced, it's like a virus in a computer. It corrupts the perfect code of life that God gave to us in his word. That's why Christ says, if you will abide in me, the word of God, and if my words, which are spirit and life, abide in you, you can ask what you will and it will be done for you. Satan said, I want to take that throne. I want to be the one that issues the commands. The Apostle Paul tells us, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, I want to I show you just a little bit of where spiritualism is today and how we are seeing evil spirits manifest physically, externally. This was a picture of me um, and the first grandmaster I trained under. And you can tell when you look in my eyes that it was, I was a different person. I don't even like looking at the pictures anymore of what I was like back then. Even my family pictures, it's like I told my wife, I said, I want to just take them down. I walk by and it's not even the same person because of what I had allowed into my life through sin and through participation in these dark arts. I want to tell a story real quickly. Um, the last grandmaster I trained under, I trained under two over the 25 years that I was active in the martial arts and Eastern mysticism. The last grandmaster I trained under, he was a 10th dawn or 10th degree in two systems of Kung Fu, of Chinese martial arts. He was also a master instructor in what's called medical Qigong or acupuncture, acupressure, laying on hands and healing people. He could put his hands on you and he could tell you had a disease and what it was. And it wasn't physical. The spirits would speak to him. It had nothing to do with you really being able to put your hands on there. You just put your hands there. Sometimes somebody would just walk in the room and you knew what was wrong with them. And you didn't know how you knew. But the devil would tell you what's well, because of your training. And pride would grow and you would become more sure of your ability. But I went to train with this man one night, and it was, uh, or one day, one weekend, and he taught only black belts, the second grandmaster I trained under. Um, you had to be a black belt, didn't matter what style it was in. So he was training all of us black belts, and then he would depend on us to take what we had learned from him to teach our students. Well, we had trained all day long, everybody was exhausted. And um, he asked us, he said, why don't we, you know, hang around here. We can get some food. Uh, we were training at his home where his studio, his uh, training hall was. And so we all were excited about the fact that, you know, he invited us to stay. Because that means you're going to get little uh, special things that he doesn't normally disclose uh, to other people. And so we sat and we ate and we talked and, and turned the television on and, just hung out for a while, and it got later and later, and I started watching the other black belts there, and they were, get, they were getting really tired. And then the Grand Master started talking about conspiracy theories, like the Illuminati and Freemasons and all anything out there, and I know a lot of it's true, but none of these guys were interested, and you could see them. They were... I mean, they were doing everything they could to stay awake. And you didn't want to fall asleep because if the Grand Master is talking and you fall asleep on him, you know you're not going to be promoted. That could put you back at least a year, maybe two years, before you're even up for promotion. So everyone is fighting to keep their eyes open 
And when he started talking about conspiracy theories, I woke up. I mean, I was just like, okay, I'm interested in this. And sometime after 12 or 1 o'clock that night, late, when everyone was really exhausted, he changed his line of thought in an instant. He's talking about all these different things, and then all of a sudden he looked at us and he said, you know, I teach you all how to tap into this power that we call chi, energy. He said, but let me tell you, if you want to see this energy demonstrated, he said, the easiest place to see this power demonstrated is look at Jimi Hendrix, look at Eric Clapton, look at a lot of the movie stars that are out there. He said, they are using the same power that we use in the martial arts, only they use it for a different reason. And when he said that, it was like a red flag went up in my mind. Because I knew, I mean, I was still going to church every week and, and you know, I was still, quote, a Christian. But I knew Jimi Hendrix was not a God-fearing man. I knew Eric Clapton was not a God-fearing man. I knew some of the Hollywood stars he talked about were not church-going, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians. And he said they were using the same power that we were, but they were using it to hypnotize, to enthrall their audiences. One day, I was there at the studio alone with him, and he, he was teaching me, and one of the black belts came running in, and he had a huge piece of artwork that was wrapped up in brown paper. And he said, see, Joe, Grandmaster, he said, it's finished, it's finished. And uh, the, the instructor, he nodded to him, you know, in dismissing him, and uh, he unwrapped the paper, and there was this beautiful Chinese calligraphy on the on the paper, on the parchment. And he had hired a Chinese artist to paint this calligraphy. And he looked at it, and I could tell he was very proud of it. And I looked at it, and I, it was beautiful, but I had no idea what it said. And he looked at me, knowing what I was thinking, and I asked him, I said, see, Joe, what does it mean? And he looked at the floor, I'll never forget this, and then he looked back up in my eyes and he said, the easiest translation in English is, it's the devil that's in the details. I should have run. I mean, I should have run. But you know what I did? Because I'd been training in these arts for over 20 years, I, I made excuses. Well, it may mean that to him, but I know, you know, it doesn't mean that to me. And people do the same thing when they talk to me about yoga. They say, well, I know they're praying to Hindu gods, but I'm praying to Jesus when I do yoga. And I'm like, you know, you can't, why, why are you in an idol's temple? You know, why even go there? He told me it's the devil that's in the details. And that was such an important truth in those arts that we trained in that he paid a lot of money to have this Chinese artist paint that. Now I want to show you what Sister White was talking about. This is Robin Williams. He passed away a few years ago. I hate what the enemy did to him because there's numerous interviews that they have done with him on different... Uh, magazines, different television shows, and he was, he was a tormented man. And he knew why he was tormented. He knew what it was. He wound up committing suicide because of what these evil spirits did to him. Listen to what he said in this interview with uh, U.S. Weekly. He said, yeah, literally, it's like possession, all of a sudden, you're in, and because it's in front of a live audience, you just get this energy that it just starts going. But there's also that thing. It is possession. In the old days, you'd be burned for it. 
but there's something empowering about it. I mean, it, it's a place where you are totally, it, it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where you really can become this other force. Maybe that's why I don't need to play evil characters in movies, because sometimes on stage, you can cross that line and still come back. He was talking about when he was a, a live comedian. He, he was talking about comedy before he became an actor. He said, it's possession. You get up there and you start talking, and he said, something else comes in, and all of a sudden you're a completely different person. You all know who this is. Oprah Winfrey. Listen to what she said. She said, I ask God for grace. And I want to ask you a question. What does the word grace mean in Greek? What's the original? Unmerited favor. Did you know that's the second definition when you look it up in Strong's? I did not know that until a few years ago. And I looked it up one day. Do you know what the first definition is? The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection as seen in the life. It's the Spirit of God. Now with that in mind, listen to what she says. I ask God for grace and the power of the spirits. Plural. Calling on you, calling on you. I really believe I can call her, this spirit, up. Her and so many others. Oprah Winfrey calls these her go-there moments, spiritual episodes of divine guidance that far transcend the chatty exchanges with her studio audiences. Winfrey says she has come to know each of them personally, and she calls them in at will to guide her in her work. That's from Time Magazine. That, I mean, that's frightening. You want to know how she got where she is? That's how. And I, I have probably more than 100 different testimonies from different people. And we're only going to show you just a few. Do you all recognize this man? Michael Landon, Little House on the Prairie. I grew up and we were allowed to watch Walt Disney one day a week, you know, came on Sunday evenings for an hour, and we could watch Little House on the Prairie, and sometimes Andy Griffith. You know, those were what you call safe, right? They're family friendly. People will say, well, they're Christian. Listen to what Michael Landon said. He said, I felt my father's presence with me. This is after his father had died. I felt my father's presence with me, enlightening my memories, helping me to commit to paper the feelings I had. I really heard my father speaking to me from the other dimension, filling my mind with just the right words. The story came so fast and was so right, in three days the script was complete. His daughter actually wrote a, a whole book on the life of her father, and she said there was often times when they were doing Little House on the Prairie or Touched by an Angel. Um, there was another one of those films that he did. I don't remember the name of it. It was a television series. And she said they would be struggling to get the script. And he would take a piece of paper or a pad of paper, go into his bedroom and lock the door. And he would come out the next morning with the entire script wrote complete. That's not possible. I've done one script in my life and it was unbelievably a long, hard haul to put down those thoughts in the order they're supposed to be in. He did it in one night, and he did it numerous times. But he would go in there, and he would speak with spirits, and they would give him the story. I'm going to skip. Yes. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, I will tell you, I, I'm hoping that I'll be able to show it later this week. 
It's an interview from, uh, with Denzel Washington, and the interview was done on 60 Minutes. He said the exact same thing. The interviewer was asking him, how did you play this part so well in this, uh, this film? And Denzel said, I could never do that. There's no way in the world I could ever make a conscious decision to act that part. And he asked him, he said, well, how did you do that? This was a powerful scene. He said, well, he said, I went into the room and got down on my knees and I asked the spirits to come in. He said, when I got up, it wasn't me anymore. And you can look that up online. Revelation chapter 18 says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, that means a loud cry, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, for she has become the habitation of devils. There's two cities in Scripture. There's Jerusalem and there's Babylon. Yes, they are literal cities, but more importantly, they are symbolic of God's people and Satan's people. Babylon has fallen and become the habitation of devils and the hold or stronghold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Before our Savior returns... Every man, woman, or child on this earth will be possessed. 100%. They will either be filled with the spirit of the living God or they will be the dwelling place of demons. Now, I grew up as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and I kind of thought demon possession was, you know, somebody's cutting themselves and they've got, you know, tattoos all over their face and they're throwing up and they're you know, acting crazy. And then I read the story about Judas that Ellen White wrote, and she said Judas was possessed with a demon of selfishness. Selfishness. That's what caused him to lose his life. And she said Christ did everything he could to keep Judas close to him to win his heart. If Judas had surrendered, Christ would have commanded that evil spirit to leave. He would have evicted him. But Judas wouldn't yield. And because of that, that spirit became stronger and he brought other spirits in. Something to make a note of. It says here about Babylon, her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. If you look up the the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, it tells us this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. That means those that have faith. He said, I will forgive your sins and iniquities and I will remember them no more. Babylon, their sins are remembered because they have no faith. They have no faith. But Israel, it says in the Old Testament, you will search for your iniquities and they won't be found. Amen. And you know when that happened? 2,000 years ago. The days in which we live are eventful and full of peril. The signs of the coming of the end are thickening all around us and events to come to pass that will be of a more terrible character than any the world has yet witnessed. For when they shall say peace and safety, 
Then sudden destruction will come upon them as a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We are to realize that the judgments of God are about to fall. We're living in this time now. It's not five years from now. It's not, t- it's now. The judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. I want you to pay attention to this. They are yet to transpire. Look at the next thing she says. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. This is not controversy. I encourage you to do the research on your own. There's other places where Ellen White says the seven trumpets, they, they were not fulfilled 150, 200, 300 years ago. They are yet to sound. When you look at the Old Testament, uh, the plan, the way of God's working in the Old Testament, He had certain special days on the calendar that marked events. You had Passover in the spring. You had first fruits, which was three days after. Then you had Pentecost. And then you had the summer. And then you had trumpets, day of atonement, tabernacles. If you look at day of atonement, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we would call that close of probation because on that day, every case was decided if you were a member of Israel, right? Before the Day of Atonement happened, 10 days prior to it, God commanded them to blow trumpets to warn the people and tell them to get ready. When you look in Revelation at the trumpets, almost every one of the trumpets, it says, and men repented not. That means they still had opportunity to repent. God sends these trumpet judgments with mercy because he's striving to win men's hearts before the close of probation, before that final day of decision is ended. She says, trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. Vile after vile poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. And we should most earnestly present before the people the warning that the Lord has commissioned us to give. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? But now you know He that withholdeth, so that he might be unveiled in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we've discussed this in some other uh, messages, but our current bishop of Rome, Pope Francis, you can do the research on your own. His sister, as well as many of the cardinals and bishops, when Pope Francis was elected to take that position, he also went into a room and closed the door alone. And they said that when he came out of the room, he was a completely different man. His sister's own words, when she wrote about him, she said, I no longer know the man that is the pope. She said, you know, I love him. He's my brother. She said, but he's not the one that went into that room. She said he was never charismatic, and now he's kissing babies and hugging people and and playing contemporary Christian rock music and, and smiling and laughing and hugging. She said he never would have done that. Even the other bishops there in the Catholic Church said a change happened, and it happened In that short time, he went into that room alone and closed that door. Is it possible that something went in to him for this last time? The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of our Lord. 
This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. Christ's righteousness. The word righteousness, we looked that up last night, and it literally means holiness, purity, innocence, victory, and perfect righteousness, perfection. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. They were struggling because in many minds, the third angel's message was, we've got to warn the world about Babylon. We've got to warn the world about the mark of the beast and about who the Pope is. And that's true, but it doesn't stop on just a physical um, description. What God was wanting to reveal to the world was the righteousness that we can have today by faith in his promises. By, we can have victory today. He says that in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. He says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. He says today is the day of your salvation. Not next week. Not 10 years from now, today, when those two men, the, the demoniacs of Gadara, they came running down the beach at Jesus. And Ellen White says that when they were running toward him, the men that were in the back seat of that vehicle, their, their body, the men that owned that body, they had been gagged and tied up and they were in the back seat. Demons, legions of fallen angels had taken possession of these men. And they saw Jesus and they were like, he can set us free. And they ran towards him in hope for freedom. And it says that when they opened their mouth to ask for help, the demons spoke through them. Rather than allowing them to speak, the demons did. And Jesus saw what was happening. And I want to tell you something. Do you know those men asked Jesus, they said, we want to go with you. Jesus did not tell them you need to go home and spend the next 12 months on Bible studies, then come back and talk to me and we can ordain you, and then you can go out and start sharing the gospel. Do you know what Jesus said? Go now and tell what great things God has done for you. When he set them free, it was not an evolutionary process. The only reason it takes us time for perfection of character is because of the lack of our faith. I know some men that, that have struggled with cigarettes for 40 years, and they would surrender to Christ, they would fight for one night on their knees, and they'd get up the next morning, and they never touch another cigarette. One night, and I know other people that have spent 10 years battling and still haven't got the victory. Is the difference because Christ's power is less in one person's life, or is it a matter of faith? Believing that God will do what he says. Amen, it's faith. When he told that man at the pool of Bethesda, Take up your bed and walk. He didn't put him on a rehabilitation program. I'm a firm believer in the health message. I drink carrot juice every day. I, I love to eat healthy. But that's not the miracle of healing. It's part of it. But God says, I speak righteousness. Just like that man at the pool of Bethesda had been laying there. He spoke the word and the man believed it. Remember that. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. For the prophet declares, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, I want, I want to show you something. They were asking, is justification by faith, is that the third angel's message? 
when you look up the word justification, and I'm going to show this over and over again because it's that important, it means to declare and render innocent, just, clean, holy, righteous, pure, and perfect. That's what justification is. That thief on the cross, I can't tell you how many Christians have written to me and said, well, you're giving me this list of things that I have to do. What about that thief on the cross? I'm not throwing out God's law. But I'm, I'm encouraging us, let's not put the cart in front of the horse. Jesus came to set us free so that we could live holy and righteous lives. Because as long as you're in bondage to the old man, you're going to work really hard and still never make it. You'll never achieve what you want. That's what Nicodemus was battling with. And Jesus said, you have to be born again. It's not you just having something else to add to your list of do's and don'ts. You have got to be begotten over again by the Spirit of the living God. And once your insides are changed, the outside will delight to obey me. In Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can it be. When we have people that will call our house and they're like, I can't get my husband to stop watching rated R movies. I can't get my, my son or my grandson to quit listening to rock and roll music. And, you know, what can I do? And I'm like, the first thing you've got to ask is, have they been born again? Have they surrendered their lives to Christ? Because if they have not done that and all you're trying to do is fix the externals, that's what the Pharisees did. They washed the outside of the tombs and inside it was full of dead men's bones. That child or that husband or that wife or your brother or sister or mother or father, if, they, if you go to them and say, you've got to stop eating pork or you've got to start going to church on Saturday and they haven't been born again, you know what they're thinking? Look, I'm already trying to do these nine, and you're just giving me one more that I can't do. I don't need more things to do. I'm not doing well on the ones I've got. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. It can't be. That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. There has to be a change inside so that the outside will blossom and produce the fruits of righteousness. Listen to what the servant of the Lord says. As yet we certainly have not seen the light that answers to this description. God has light for his people, and all who will accept it will see the sinfulness of remaining in a lukewarm condition. They will heed the counsel of the true witness when he says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I'm standing at the door of your heart knocking, and if any man will hear my voice, my word, and open the door, I will come in to you and I will sup with you, and you with me. Do you know what that sup means? It means he'll have dinner with you. What does he feed us? The bread of life. He said, that's what John 6 was all about. Eat my words. Make them part of your life. Satan is doing the exact same thing. He told Eve at the, at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if you will just eat of what I'm offering you, then you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He wanted them to partake of his words and his spirit rather than the spirit of the living God. Serpents whisper in the shadow of doubt. 
the serpent's whisper. This takes us back all the way to the very beginning. And tomorrow evening and tonight, but tomorrow evening especially, we're going to bring together again these, these pieces of the puzzle and we're going to show how this relates to spiritual formation in the emerging church. We did some of that last night, but tomorrow night especially. But I want you to listen to what we're told. What exactly is spiritual formation? I have many people that will talk to me. They'll, they'll meet at a, a conference or something, and there's, there's, I don't even know what it is. What is spiritual formation? They know people say it's bad, but they don't know what it is. And I have to admit, I knew it was bad. I knew that you had this liberal theology that was attached to it. But I wondered, I was like, what does that mean? Why does it have that name, spiritual formation? Here's a couple of colleges and universities that are heavy promoters of this. Um, I don't want to name names, but you can read those there for yourself. Um, it's, in, it's in every denomination, not just ours. It's everywhere. When you see what the Apostle Paul says, it makes this clear. He says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. For we, brethren, just as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he which was born after or begotten by the flesh persecuted him that was born by the Spirit, even so it is now. Spiritual formation is forming a man or woman into the image of God. Do you remember what Satan said to Eve? If you will obey, if you'll listen to my words and eat of my words, you will be like God's. How much more like God could you be? They were already made in his image. Adam, Luke says, was the son of God by creation. You can't be any more like God than to be his son or daughter. But Satan said, you're not really. You're not really like God. Taste and see. Try what I'm offering you and then you'll be like God. The first sin that caused the fall of the entire human race was doubting who they were as sons and daughters of the living God. Do you know what the first temptation that Christ faced in the wilderness was? The exact same thing. Satan came to him, and Ellen White says, it's when Satan said if that then Christ recognized who he was. Satan appeared as an angel of light. Christ did not recognize him until Satan started speaking. And Satan told Christ, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone to be made bread. When he said if, Christ recognized this is him. And he, amen, that's right. When he came up out of the river, Jordan, after being baptized, his father had declared from heaven, thou art my beloved son. In thee am I well pleased. Christ had to walk by faith. Now, I want to encourage you with something. I also want to challenge you. Do you know what it says in 1 John? It says, now are you the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be like, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're not waiting for some day to become children of God. And the word sons in Greek means children begotten. So it means sons and daughters. I'm not trying to pervert scripture, but I mean, we can take that and know that we're on safe ground. Men and women. Mankind. But it says now, now we are the children of God. And then look what it says in John 1. Born 
not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will or power of man, but of God. I cannot tell you how many Christians are striving with all their might to achieve something that's impossible for man to do. You have to believe it, and then it becomes yours. That's called fighting the fight of faith. You have to believe God's promise and appropriate it as your own. And when you take hold of that promise and you say, it's yea and amen in Christ Jesus. I am his, he is mine, that promise is mine. When you do that and you speak faith, Ellen White says, you will have faith. And Hebrews 11 says faith is the very substance of the things you have been given confidence and assurance of. Amen. To whom God would make known what is the riches, the abundance of the glory of this mystery. Remember we talked about those two mysteries, the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity. Paul's talking about the mystery of godliness here. He says to us, to whom God would make known what is the abundance of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, even that mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints." Today, if you will, but hear my voice, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Every promise in Christ Jesus is yea and in him, amen. He says, if you'll only believe. And I can remember when I was battling to get free, I, I told the Lord one day, it was like I saw it, it says, whosoever believes shall be saved. And the word saved does not mean you have a free ticket to get into heaven. The word saved in Greek and Hebrew means rescued, delivered, set free, healed, and made whole. And I looked that day because I was crying out to God for freedom. I mean, the martial arts and Eastern mysticism was just a, that was just a tiny little part of the, the sins I had been in bondage to. Going through that divorce with my wife and I'd committed adultery and I had, I had baggage from all the way back when I was a child. And I was begging God, I need freedom. I need salvation. And God told me, he said, you don't even know what the word saved means. He said, look it up. And I looked it up and it said that. Freedom, rescue, deliverance, healing, and to make you whole. And I said, God, there's five definitions. Which one is right? And you know what he told me? Which one do you need today? Where are you? Do you need physical healing? And you know what? When he spoke that to me, I started that day. I opened up the Gospels. I said, I'm not leaving the Gospels. I got a notepad out, and I just started reading the Gospels, and I made a note every single time I saw a captive set free. I saw someone healed. I saw someone forgiven. I saw a prostitute forgiven. And I was like, God, you know, I, I committed adultery, but I've never charged somebody for it. And God was like, I know. I can handle. You don't have a sin that's bigger than me. And I made a note of every single time Christ healed and set someone free. And every time it was based on one thing. Did they believe what God had already promised to do? And I, to, I told the Lord, I said, I, I'm, I'm there in the house by myself. My wife is a school teacher. My children are going to school. And I looked up because I was so desperate. I said, how do I believe? I can't even make myself believe. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. And the Lord Jesus Christ told me in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, he said, Eric, quit reading my word silently in your head. Start reading it out loud. 
And I'll never forget the man that first encouraged me to do that. He was an older man of God. I don't even know what church he went to, but I'd called him on the phone because I desperately needed help. And he asked me that question. He said, Eric, when you read God's word, do you read it in your head or do you read it out loud? I said, in my head. He said, when you pray, do you pray only in your head or do you pray out loud? I said, in my head. And then he asked me a question I'll never forget. He said, why? And I said, I don't want the devil to hear me. And you know what he said? He said, do you think the devil's stronger than the one you're praying to? And I went, oh, wow. That was the last time I worried about the devil hearing my prayers. If I don't want the devil to hear what I'm saying, you know what I do? I say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want this prayer between, to be between me and you and my Father in heaven, and that's it. I ask you in your name. And Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We don't fear the devil. It doesn't mean we have to be arrogant and foolish. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And as I started reading his promises out loud, faith grew like I, have ne I never could have imagined how much the faith grew. And I still battle. I still have days where I come under attack. And my wife, I'll call her. And when I'm having a bad day, the Lord will have her on top of the mountain. And she'll say, let me pray with you, Eric. And she'll speak those promises out loud. And she'll say, don't speak the doubt. Speak faith in his word. And Ellen White said the same thing. She said, don't talk about what the devil's done to you. Talk about the promises of your, your Savior and your mighty God. Amen. Let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should change your mind. Your word has gone forth and it shall not return unto you void. Father, you have spoken and you will make it good. Father, you have told us through faith and patience we inherit the promises. And Father, we are going to do like Jacob did. We are going to grab hold on your son and say, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Not because we are worthy, but because he is worthy. And because you are faithful and cannot lie. Father, we pray for every family and individual that is represented here tonight. Father, let us not only discern the evil, but most importantly, let us see and know your power in our lives. 